An essential aspect of historically informed performance is choosing the appropriate instruments to perform a particular piece. This can be trickier than it sounds because in contrast to our own standardized modern instruments, the instruments of the past were not standardized at all. For instance, if we look back to the early 19th century and we're trying to choose a piano, we find that depending on which city or which country you are, there are completely different pianos that exist. And what is very interesting is that these pianos really influence composers and performers to write and perform music very differently. For instance, in 1853, Friedrich Wieck, the father of Clara Schumann, had this to say about Viennese and English pianos. Of great difference in playing and composition was the difference in pianos which both schools use, the variance between the Viennese and the English pianos. So even back then, musicians were very aware that depending on the instrument that one used, this could really affect the composition and also the performance of a piece. Now, this video is not going to be about pianos, it's going to be about harpsichords and about the appropriate harpsichord that we need to perform a certain 20th century piece. With harpsichords, we have an additional problem because there are not only historical models, but there is also a 20th century type of harpsichord, the so-called revival harpsichord. Now, let me backtrack a little bit. The inspiration for this video was my revisiting a particular record that I had bought when I was 13 years old. And this is a record of um, Poulenc's Concert Champêtre for harpsichord and orchestra. The record itself is this one here. And as I said, I bought it when I was 13. It was issued in 1984. And this is a performance of Concert Champêtre and the Concerto for Two Pianos. The Concert Champêtre is performed by Jean-Patrice Pros, and we have here the Monte Carlo Philharmonic Orchestra conducted by Georges Prêtre. Now, what is interesting about this, when I, when I bought this, um, this was my very first recording that I bought of this piece. I had known this already, and I had known it through this cassette tape, and I think if you look at it, you can tell it's really, really old. It's from the early 70s. And um, I don't know who the performers are in this cassette tape. I know that Concert Champetre is on the tape. I had listened to it many, many times. I don't know who the performers are. It sounds to me now, I, I listened to it again a few days ago, and somehow they, they have managed, and I mean the performers, whoever they may be, they have managed to find this sort of existentialist dread to this composition, which is kind of bizarre. But this is the performance I, I kind of grew up with. But then I wanted to buy a performance on, on record and, of course, to have also better sound quality. So, so this, is, this is what I bought. Um, sadly, I should say already that um, this has not been reissued on CD as far as I know. Now, when I bought this in 1984, I noticed that it said here that uh, Jean-Patrice Pros is playing a Pleyel harpsichord. Now, as a 13-year-old, I didn't know what that was. I was a pianist back then. I knew what Pleyel pianos were. And also at that time, I was not totally aware of the differences between revival harpsichords and historical harpsichords. I knew that there were harpsichords that sounded very different from one another, but I hadn't really studied harpsichords yet. So um, somehow what happened was that, uh, that I, I got this recording and of course the Pleyel harpsichord is the quintessential revival instrument. Now, what is a revival harpsichord? Well, what you have is that in the early 20th century, if I can simplify the story a little bit, there were probably musicians and uh, builders that thought that they could outdo what the older historical models were like. 
Now, this was not the only kind of trend in the early, early 20th century. There was also someone like Arnold Dolmetsch, who was trying to be a little more historically informed. However, what really became the standard was this kind of revival harpsichord, and it was really popularized also by Wanda Landowska, who actually commissioned one of the first of these revival harpsichords by Pleyel. So the Pleyel revival harpsichord was the one that Landowska had, and it was the one that she promoted. And in many respects, because of her energy and her willingness to really promote harpsichord music, this was the type of harpsichord that really existed for at least the first five decades of the 20th century. Now, what is different about the revival harpsichord to a historical harpsichord? Well, there are a few differences, but let's, let's look at them one at a time. First of all, I have here a, a historical harpsichord, and you will see it has two manuals, and normally in a in this kind of more, more standard, shall we say, 18th century harpsichord, we have three different sets of strings that are being plucked individually or in combination with one another. So the lower manual has what we call the eight foot, which is the strings sounding in the appropriate, in the standard octave. The upper manual also has an 8 foot. It sounds a little different because the strings are, this is a different set of strings, but it's also being plucked in a slightly different area of the string compared to the bottom manual. And then the bottom manual also has another set of strings that's sounding an octave above. This is what we call the 4 foot. And I'm not playing the upper C because this is not totally in tune, but you get the point. So um, anyway, so I can combine these. I can also couple the manuals so I can have I can have the two eight feet sounding together and I can also have them with a, with a four foot sounding together. So we have these, these different combinations. Well, there were some exceptional instruments of the 18th century that could add a little more to this. But basically, the idea behind the revival harpsichord was to try to add as many sets of strings as possible. So you don't just have the, the eight-foot stops and the four-foot stops, so the four-foot sounds an octave above, but you have a two-foot stop, which sounds an octave above the four-foot stop, and I would really not want to have that because I cannot imagine what it must be like tuning it. And then you also have a 16-foot stop, which sounds an octave below the 8-foot. In addition to this, they put a few more bells and whistles, and because they wanted to create a case that could um, house all of these different strings, they decided, and this I would say is the big mistake that they made, to add a metal soundboard. So you have lots and lots of strings, they, they wanted all of these, they, they wanted to provide a lot more structural support for all of these extra strings, all of the bells and whistles for these instruments, so they added a metal soundboard. And also the other thing that they did is that instead of having everything controlled manually, so you can't see it here, but I have a little lever that I can engage and disengage the forefoot, and then if I want to have um, the two eight feet playing together, I kind of move in the, the top manual, I couple the manuals, as we say. Well, they had a different idea. Everything was controlled by pedals, so you could change sounds anytime you wanted to. So this is what happened with this revival harpsichord, and I would say um, it's kind of hard to really be totally objective about this, I would say this is probably true for many, many harpsichordists. It's very hard to really like that instrument for, for several reasons. One thing, of course, that happens is that this is not a piano. It's an instrument that plucks strings. So 
the moment you add a metal soundboard, you take away one of the most important aspects of a harpsichord, and that is its resonance. Those revival harpsichords simply don't resonate enough, and one funny byproduct of having a metal soundboard is you have this, this giant, massive instrument, all of these strings, you press the key, and you really can't hear it very well. Uh, as a matter of fact, the harpsichordist Ralph Kirkpatrick used to refer to them as whisper chords, because really they, they look much more massive than this, and yet they really don't sound that much because it's, it's metal, so it doesn't resonate, the sound doesn't simply spread out as nicely. Um, the other thing that happens with these instruments has to do with the touch. We have here a metal soundboard, you have all of these strings that are being plucked at the same time, and another essential aspect of harpsichord playing has to do with being able to feel how the instrument plucks. So you have a fairly soft touch, especially compared to a piano. But on a revival harpsichord, the touch is extremely heavy. And if you've looked at pictures of uh, van der Landowska's hands, you'll see them being kind of like this, like little claws. And if you look at other performers of the time, you'll, you'll see this thing too. This is because you need massive strength to, to really press down the keys. So if you're trying to phrase something, well, phrasing goes out the window because when I have played on, on these revival instruments, uh, my first uh, question is, do, am I pressing hard enough to get the instrument to sound? So I don't, I don't have the chance to really think about phrasing. The first thing is like, how do I make this, this thing sound? Um, so all of these different aspects of this instrument have really um, made, once we, once we decided to start copying historical instruments and building instruments according to historical specifications, this has meant that there has been a backlash to the way we regard these revival harpsichords. As I mentioned before, revival harpsichord is really the most polite name that we use for this. Um, a slightly less polite name is a plucking piano, and it really goes downhill from there. So I, I will spare you some other epithets that I've heard um, when musicians refer to these, to these harpsichords. And I want here to read you one more quote. This is by uh, harpsichordist Mitzi Meyerson, and Meyerson gave a recital on two different instruments. One was a playel, and one was a historical harpsichord. And in that recital, she kind of talked about the difference between those two, the historical harpsichord and the playel. And this is what she had to say. Playing on a historical harpsichord is to playing on the playel about the same as hang gliding on a summer's day to driving a tank through a minefield. This may sound extreme, but honestly, in some respects, this is how I feel when I have to play a uh, revival harpsichord. Now, the issue we're dealing with nowadays is this. When it comes to the traditional harpsichord repertory, we have historical instruments and we perform it on those historical instruments. But what are we going to do when it comes to 20th century harpsichord music? The issue here is very complex because Nowadays, we may say, okay, well, we don't like these revival harpsichords. However, many 20th century composers actually grew up with the sound of these revival harpsichords. This is what they knew. And when they wrote their pieces for harpsichord, what they had in mind was this revival harpsichord, not the historical ones that we're using nowadays. And actually, one of the interesting side effects, shall we say, of having switched to historical instruments is that if, say, you want to perform the music of Rameau, we have several different historical copies of models of Rameau's time so that we can get very, very close to what Rameau had in mind for his harpsichord music. On the other hand, revival harpsichords are almost obsolete, so actually if you want the 
particular appropriate harpsichord for a 20th century piece, it's very difficult to find because, as I said, we, we don't have these revival harpsichords anymore. And the issue that I wanted to discuss is what we do as performers when we're trying to be historically informed for 20th century music, because in many respects, historically informed performance has moved to the 20th century nowadays. And what we do is actually very, very interesting because supposedly there is a historically informed performance of Poulenc's Concert Champetre. This is a recording that was issued in 2011. I'm not showing you the cover because I only have it in digital form. Here we have Jos van Immersel and his orchestra Anima Eterna, and the album is really Poulenc's Concert Champetre and the Concerto for Two Pianos. Now, what is interesting here, and this is why I felt like I wanted to make this video, is that for the Concerto for Two Pianos, Van Immersel has gone back and used two Playel pianos from the turn of the century. I think, if I remember correctly, one is from 1895 and the other one from 1905 or something like that. When it came to the Concert Champetre, the instrument that they used was not a Playel harpsichord, but as a matter of fact, a modern copy of a Goujon instrument, so a French harpsichord from 1749. The question is, why did they do that? I would say that here we run into the issue of historically informed performance and sometimes how much historically informed performers are really willing to be historically informed. Now, I realize that, that Jos van Inversel is a very, very respected um, performer. I really admire his recordings, but to me, in this particular instance, it's almost as if the dislike that historically informed performers have for the revival harpsichord influenced the choice of instruments. Because to me, it's very clear. You're trying to reproduce the sounds that Poulenc had heard. Poulenc wrote this piece for Van der Landowska and the Playel harpsichord. There is, there is absolutely no doubt about that. We know this for a fact. So you're trying to recreate the sound world that Poulenc had in mind. You choose the appropriate instruments, you go back when it comes to the, to the piano concerto, you choose two play yells from the turn of the century, and then why when it comes to the harpsichord we choose a 18th century model. This to me makes absolutely no sense. Now, I will admit that it's very difficult playing on a playel. As I, as I mentioned before, if you're used to historical harpsichords, the action is extremely heavy. But on the other hand, what I would say is that the type of nervous writing that you see in Poulenc's Concert Champetre, and in many respects in the writing of 20th century composers for the harpsichord, really reflects this instrument's, the revival harpsichord's, inability to resonate. So what do these composers do? They write music that is very fast, that is very busy, because they're trying to fill in the gap for this lack of resonance. So when we're listening to the Poulenc, to me, when I listen to this on, on a Playel harpsichord, you have all of these different layers. I mean, here's a, a neoclassical piece, a 20th century piece, imitating the 18th century style and of course we also have a 20th century harpsichord semi-imitating the 18th century model and this this kind of complexity i would say is lost when you say okay well we're going to use historical instruments or or whatever but then we're going to use an unhistorical harpsichord, and in many respects here, the historical harpsichord is unhistorical for this particular repertory. So I felt this was, um, in some respects, a missed opportunity 
to record the piece in, in a historically informed way. But I also thought it was a very interesting type of issue to identify when it comes to historically informed performance. What kind of choices do we make? And do we make choices that where we try to be as objective as possible, or do we let our own personal preferences influence our choices? Of course, in many respects, there's always subjectivity involved. But to me, in this particular instance, I would say the historical record is very clear. The harpsichord that one should really use for Concert Champetre is the Playel harpsichord. Incidentally, I do not mean to say that we shouldn't do it any other way. Um, personally, I would really not want to be playing on a Playel for 30 minutes. That's, <laughs> that sounds a little painful. But on the other hand, if we're going to be historically informed, if we're going to be releasing a recording that's historically informed, I think it's worth it to go all the way and really try to recreate the sounds that a composer had in mind. And even if we think we don't like that, maybe there's something to learn from there. Otherwise, we go back to the, well, I play Bach on the piano because I like it and Bach would have liked it too. Well, you know, that's wishful thinking. So um, let's hope that at some point in time there will be another recording of Poulenc's Concert Champetre played on a Playel harpsichord and also with the instruments of uh, Poulenc's time. In the meantime, if you can find this anywhere, as far as I know, this is the only recording that exists on a Playel harpsichord. There may be others from the past. I'm not sure about that. I would have to search. As far as what exists on CD, perhaps nothing exists on CD. The Jos van Immersel recording is really, really excellent, but I have to admit, I really wish they had used the Playel harpsichord. As always, thank you for watching.